Carla Cohen. I'm one of the owners of Politics and Prose, and I want to welcome all of you tonight, and I particularly, we're very honored to have Daniel Dennett here. Um, this is, um, I know that a lot of you are here because of the importance of the topic. Last week I went to see the Darwin exhibit at the Museum of Natural History in New York. The exhibit was not only a chance for a layperson to understand more about Darwin's theory, but it was a glimpse of the culture wars that we are now undergoing in the United States. Throughout the exhibit, one could see purposeful answers to the attacks on natural selection. There was a discussion of what a scientific theory is. There was a discussion of what the theory has contributed to science. And there was a discussion of the difference between religion and science and how scientists can be religious. For this reason, it is only, and I use the word advisedly, natural that Dr. Dennett would write a book about the human need for spirituality. Dr. Daniel Dennett is one of the leading philosophers in the United States. He teaches at Tufts University and heads the Center for Cognitive Studies there. He has been consistent in his professional interests looking at the question, how can meaning, design, and morality arise in a universe that began as meaningless, without form? He answers that Darwinism gives us the perspective to see how meaning and function and purpose can come to exist in a world that is intrinsically meaningless. And he, in, in this, his new book, Breaking the Spell, examines the uh, natural evolution of religion as a way of explaining phenomenon, material phenomenon. So it's a companion piece to Darwin's dangerous idea, and, um, but a completely different kind of book as well. So we're very, very happy to have Dr. Daniel Dennett here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh. Uh, I hope it's I hope it's worth the wait. I'm sorry that I'm uh, late in getting set up, but uh, you're very very kind to wait. Now let's see if my technology will work. Yes, wonderful. A few years ago, I found myself asking the, myself the question: What's going to happen to religion in the next hundred years, or just in my lifetime? What what are we going to see? What's going to happen? And I came to the realization I didn't have the foggiest idea what was going to happen. But then, as far as I could tell, nobody else did either. There were a lot of people that had convictions, but there didn't seem to be any way of sorting them out. Just to give you an idea of how, how sort of uh, strangely uh, uh, uncertain it is, I want to just walk through five possible scenarios. There's others. But these are just sort of five possible scenarios of what might happen to religion in the next few decades in the next hundred years, something like this. The first one I want to look at is, well, the Enlightenment's over, you know. Uh, uh, religion is going gonna, is gonna to sweep the planet. Now, which religion is it going to be? It's not really clear. Uh, maybe it'll be Islam, maybe it'll be Christianity, maybe it'll be Buddhism, who knows. Whatever religion yours is, if you have a religion, it probably won't be yours. There are more people who don't want your religion to sweep the planet than who do, no matter what your religion is. Uh, so it's worth bearing that in mind. Well, there's one prospect. Here's another one, is that religion is, in fact, in its death throes. There are some people who believe that, who think that what we're seeing now are the last sort of chaotic spasms, that, that, that within the life of, of our grandchildren, perhaps, it will really pretty well evaporate the, the Enlightenment anticipation, which was certainly what people thought a few hundred years ago. They were just wrong. But it's going to come true just a few centuries late. And that, who knows, maybe the, uh, the Vatican will become, you know, the European Museum of Roman Catholicism. <laughs> maybe, maybe Mecca will become Disney's Magic Kingdom of Allah. You think, uh, never going to happen, never going to happen. Well, Stranger things have happened. After all, here's the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. It started off as a church, of course. Then it was a mosque. Now it's a museum. And that's in Turkey. So who knows what the future will bring? There's another hypothesis. Let's look at a third. Maybe religions are going to transform themselves into something unlike anything we've seen on this planet. Sort of creedless moral teams with a lot of teamwork, a lot of pageantry. Different songs, different colors, different traditions, 
loyalty, you know. Would you want your daughter to marry a Yankees fan? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll have a sort of creedless moral teamwork with pageantry. That's, that's, that's a possibility. And of course there are some churches which are already going in those directions. Another possibility is that maybe religion will just diminish in prestige uh, more or less the way smoking has. You know, this is, <laughs> yeah, you can be elected to office if you smoke, but you know, you should sort of do it, you know, in privacy and you shouldn't interfere with anybody else in the practice of your religion. Maybe, maybe we can have a, a, a scene where, where uh, uh, religions are, are tolerated, of course, uh, but, but not encouraged and, uh, uh, and certainly not in any particular sense honored. There's another prospect, rather unlikely, I'm sure. And then there's another one. Judgment Day arrives. <laughs> and there may be people in this room who think, oh, that's it, finally he's got to the truth. You know, that's what's going to happen. And, and if, you, if you believe the recent Newsweek poll, uh, something like a majority of our fellow citizens believe that this is true. Something like a majority. And I don't know, 20% think it's going to happen in their own lifetime. Well, now there's five scenarios, and what's puzzling about this, what's, what's unsettling about this is the following. All but one of these, <laughs> maybe all of them, are, are, are not just false, but wildly false. Which one's right? Nobody knows. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. And it seems to me that's a pretty shocking state of affairs, that we, we are so unable to cast our predictive eyes ahead and think about what's going to happen to religion. That's, that was the state of mind I was in when I decided it really is time to see what's happening in the, in the attempt to study religion scientifically. The way we study economies and energy budgets and global warming and El Nino and fresh water and all the other important prod, uh, physical problems, a, a phenomenon, natural phenomenon in the planet. We, we really want to know what's going to happen. We ought to be able to get some purchase on it. In other words, what we need to do is we need to study religion scientifically the same way we'd study these other, these other projects. That's all I'm asking. But of course, this is a frightening and disturbing prospect to many people. That's why this book is, unlike my earlier books, uh, uh, it's a much more, in some sense, political book. It's not, it's not a philosophy book for philosophers and it's not a scientific book for scientists. It's a book for everybody about the need to study religion scientifically, the importance of that, and a sketch of how we might go about doing it. It doesn't have answers, it has questions. Religion is manifestly, among other things, a natural phenomenon. It's a social phenomenon, you can see it, you can measure it, you can study it, you can do statistics on it, you can look at its history, and that's what I'm proposing that we should do. Something that is as familiar as religion is something that we might want to get a little distance from by pretending we were Martians. Thinking about what would Martian scientists think of when they came to this planet? What would, they, what would strike them? Uh, what, would, what would strike them as in need of explanation? And here's one thing. I wonder if anybody knows what this is a picture of. Looks, it looks a little bit like it might be a, something you'd see under a, a, a microscopic slide some sort of interesting uh, infestation there down at the bottom. I'll tell you what that is. That's a satellite photograph taken in 2001 of the Kumela gathering in North. There's approximately a million people in that picture gathering on the banks of the Ganges and going in into the river. That's perhaps the largest single gathering of human beings that's ever happened on the planet. Happens every dozen years. Here's a similar gathering, not quite so large or impressive, but in a very impressive place. And here's another one. Certainly the Martian biologists, the Martian, the uh, exo-Martian faunologists, this is what they call themselves, studying the animals on a, another planet, would find among the phenomena that were really fascinating these tremendously energetic, expensive, extravagant gatherings and they think what on earth is going on here uh, and how did all this originate and the answer to that is well it originated all fairly recently by 
geological or biological standards, religion is very young. It's only been around for maybe tens of thousands of years. It's younger than language, and that's been around hard to say. Some people think a million years, some people think a few hundred thousand years. Agriculture is 10,000 years old. The oldest known organized religion, Judaism, is only 2,000 years old. Or maybe that's not the oldest. Maybe we can go back to some, some earlier religions. But there, there's no, there's no well-known, well-understood religion that we can go back more than about 3,000 years. That's, that's very young. And, and of course, a lot of the religions are much younger. Uh, the Mormons, very recent religion. And we know that religions are born, sects are born every day. The websites can't keep up with them. Most of them last a few weeks or a few months or maybe a year or two and then go extinct. We don't know how many thousands, how many tens of thousands of religions have come and gone in the last hundred thousand years. Maybe it's millions, gone without a trace. But some have survived and flourished and leave a very big footprint on the world. And the question is why? What is it about them as natural phenomena that's permitted them to have the staying power, the stamina, the robustness, the growth. These are questions that you can ask as a, as a historian, as a, as a, as a theologian, as a, as a psychologist, as an archaeologist. You can also ask them as a biologist. This is, these facts are perfectly visible to the natural sciences. It's hard to know whether the natural sciences can do anything to study them. I want to say, in fact, they can. These are, these are good questions that a biologist should scratch his or her head about and see what they come up with. Not just biologists, but biologists among others. What's it for? How does it perpetuate itself? Second law of thermodynamics tells us that nothing complicated survives without renewal, without, without repair. What, what maintains these amazing structures over centuries, over vast distances of time and space? Well, here's another thing that might really fascinate a biologist from Mars, or you. Suppose you are out in the meadow and you see an ant that's climbing up a blade of grass. Climbs and climbs. If it falls, it climbs again. Climbs and climbs until it gets to the very top of that blade of grass. Sort of like Sisyphus rolling his rock. It keeps climbing up. You think, what is this ant doing? What? What benefit accrues to this ant? Is it, is it looking for food? Is it looking for its cousins, its brothers, its sisters? Is it looking for a mate? Is it showing off? What is it doing? What benefit accrues to the ant? If you ask yourself that question, turns out you're asking the wrong question. No benefit accrues to the ant at all. Well, then what is this? colossal expenditure of energy for? Is it just a fluke? Yeah, it's just a fluke. It's a brain fluke, a lancet fluke. It's a small parasite, brain worm if you like, has climbed into the ant's brain and lodged there and is now driving it like an all-terrain vehicle up a blade of grass because it, the fluke, has to get into the belly of a sheep or a cow to continue its life cycle. Salmon fight to swim upstream so that they can breed. Birds fly long distances. We all recently learned about the penguins. What an amazing thing they do. Dicrocelium dendriticum has an easy route. It just climbs into an ant's brain and full speed ahead up that blade of grass. <laughs> That's pretty spooky. It's not, it's not a, a, an isolated case. There are, in fact, many parasites that manipulate their hosts. Here's another one. Toxoplasma gondii, uh, this uh, one host is, a, is a, say, a, a mouse. And it has to get itself into the belly of a cat. Well, now what would you do if you were inside a mouse and you needed to get inside a cat? What would you do to that mouse? What you do is you turn it into mighty mouse. Make it fearless and bold so it runs right out in the open. It's not showing off, it's not hunting for food, it's not doing anything to benefit itself. 
It is on a fairly self-destructive course, but it's of great benefit to Toxoplasma gondii. <laughs> now, these are sort of spooky cases where we have a sort of hijacker that, a parasite that infects the brain of a host and induces suicidal behavior. Behavior which has no benefit at all uh, to, the, to the genetic fitness of, of the host. And you might ask yourself the question, gosh, uh, does anything like that happen in us? <laughs> Pretty spooky? Well, I'd like to remind you that the Arabic word Islam means submission. It means surrender of self-interest to the will of Allah. But it's not just Islam, Christianity too. This is a bad photograph, I apologize for the quality of this, of a, of a piece of parchment, music manuscript that I got in a Paris bookstall about 50 years ago, and it dates from the uh, 16th century, from about 1540. And it's sort of interesting, if you, uh, if you squint just right, you maybe can read what it says. It says, um, Semen est verbum dei sator autem Christus. The est is understood. Interesting little curiosity is that Christus is spelled with the Greek chi rho, xp, and then the scribe hasn't known that the rho was an r, so he's added an r, sort of a belt and suspender. So we have chi rho, r-i-s-t-u-s. What's that mean? It means, as anybody who took first year Latin will tell you, the word of God is a seed, and the sower of the seed is Christ. And it goes on to say, omnis qui audit eum manebit in eternum. All who hears the word will have eternal life. So there's a quid pro quo. Now, what are these? These are ideas to die for. These are ideas that inhabit people's brains and inspire them to set aside their genetic interests, to set aside their interests in grandchildren, to set aside the risk to their lives, to devote their lives to the furtherance of an idea that has become lodged in their brain. There's many ideas to die for. For instance, there's not just Islam and, say, Catholicism, there's communism. Think of how many people in the last century gave up their lives and killed a lot of other people in order to further that idea. Or democracy is another good idea that a lot of people have given up their lives for. Willingly, eagerly. Justice, freedom. I live in Massachusetts, just to the north of me, in New Hampshire. The license plates look like this. Live free or die. That is the motto of the state of New Hampshire. And it's worth reflecting on the fact that the moose may live in New Hampshire, but it doesn't have that perspective on life at all. <laughs> it's, it's, there's only one species on the planet that has evolved the capacity to have an idea that's worth dying for, to have that perspective on life. Um, I look around, I see quite a few folks that are my age or thereabouts or even older, I'm sure a lot of you are, are grandparents. How, how many grandparents have we got out there? Not a lot. Yeah. How many of you think that the most important thing in life is having more grandparents, grandchildren, having more grandchildren than your neighbors? <laughs> Not a single hand goes up. That's a stupendous biological fact. There is no other species on the planet that does not have that as its ultimate sumum bonum. Those swan salmon swimming upstream, they can't think, you know, I'd really rather study French literature, you know, the heck. <laughs> Kids, forget it. Yeah. No, we're the only species that has found the sort of conceptual leverage to see other prospects of this sort. This is an amazing fact about us. Now, People hear this comparison of mine with the, with the brain fluke, and they think, this is, man, this is ill-advised. This is shocking. This is offensive to many religious people. You shouldn't use this. And I say, no, on the contrary. First of all, they themselves make quite a big thing of the fact that their religion, that isn't like buying a car. 
This is something that they are devoted to. This is, they are proud of the fact that they have put their interests in second place and the interests of those ideas in first place. Well, that's the way it looks from the normal human perspective, and I'm just showing you how it looks from the biological perspective. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just there is this way of looking at the phenomena of ideas to die for from a biological perspective, and it starts to make sense of some of the things that we know about religion. It's, it gives us a different way of looking at what makes us special as a species and the role that religious ideas play in that. Human culture is itself one of the fruits on the tree of life. Now the tree of life unites us all. Now here's a picture of the tree of life, if I can get my thing to work. Now you won't be able to see it from here. This is, doesn't look like, much like a tree, but that's because you're looking from the top down. Right in the center you can see the trunk, and right in the center of the trunk you can see uh, a, a sort of a, a, a Mercedes sign there. And right at, the, right at the center of that is Luca. That's the last universal common ancestor. That's an organism that is in fact the great 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 grandmother of us all. Not just of us, but of every blade of grass and every bacterium and every fish and every whale. That's the tree of life. And the scientist who drew this diagram had a nice sense of humor and put up in this corner, uh, uh, let me see if I can make it, come on, oh, pushing the wrong button. Here we are. That circle there, corner. There's three species lined up on the end of that twig on the on the eukaryote branch, and they are uh, uh, Coprinus, Homo, and Zea. Three close relatives on the tree of life in our genealogy. You want to have these cousins of yours close. What are they? Well, they're mushrooms, us, and corn. Well, we're quite different from the mushrooms and the corn in many ways. And I think the main way we're different is that we've got culture. We have language, we have music, we have art. And so we have a whole other realm of development which is simply not available to these other species. And the fruits of the tree of life include not only beaver dams, which are partly culturally transmitted, you know. The beavers sort of teach their young a little bit. It's not all just in the genes. There's, there's some cultural transmission in other species. Not just the beaver dam, but the, but the hoover dam. They're both artifacts made by mammals, after all. Not just spider webs, but the internet, the world wide web, the power grid. These are networks made by a biological species and maintained at great expense, and we can ask what they're for and why they're maintained, and whether or not we're being perhaps enslaved by something that we've made. Not just a bird's nest, but an ode to a nightingale. I find a lot of Darwin skeptics, Darwin haters, who say, well, well, evolution's just great for, for things like birds and plants and animals and so forth, but, but not, for, not for things like, like poems. And I think, you think that a bird is not as wonderful as a poem? Have you ever looked closely at a bird and realized how exquisite the design of that thing is? If evolution by natural selection can account for all the exquisite design of a bird, I think you can probably do a pretty good job on a poem too. It's a very different kind of artifact, a different kind of designer. But there are fruits on the tree of life. And even human culture gets underway without any insightful design, designer, to prime the pump. One of the things about, for instance, human languages is that they didn't have creators. Most of the words that we speak were never coined by anybody. The grammars weren't laid down by any grammar king or lawgiver. These things are evolved products. And they've evolved not by genetic evolution, but by cultural evolution. In other words, there are a lot of ideas, cultural ideas, items of culture, that hijack our brains, that enter our brains, and then reproduce. 
make more copies. We rehearse them over and over and over again. We think about them, say them again, reflect on them, and then we pass them on to our neighbor. Some ideas do this better than others. They have offspring, that have offspring, that have offspring. This gives us a different perspective on human culture and on human religion. These replicating ideas include music, ritual, art, science. They survive translation into other languages. Now, the word for these, coined, here is a coined word by Richard Dawkins 30 years ago in his book, The Selfish Gene. He coined the word memes for these. Now, if you just have an idea, you know, you just suddenly think of a orange cat. That's not a meme. Only if it replicates, only if you spread it and it becomes important and everybody starts thinking about that orange cat, then now you've got a meme on your hands. And what are they? Well, he says they're analogous to genes. They're analogous, moreover, to viruses. What's a virus? It's a sort of naked gene. It doesn't have its own reproductive machinery. It just happens to be designed so that when it gets into a cell which does have copy machine, it takes over the copy machine and makes more copies of itself. My, my slogan for this, I came up with this a few years ago, is that uh, a virus is a string of nucleic acid with attitude. <laughs> it just, it provokes its own replication. And I was delighted to find an evolutionary biologist who'd made exactly the same coin, and she was very happy. She said, oh yeah, that's, just, that's what I'm saying in my textbook, too. So uh, there's a case of convergent evolution in the <laughs> memosphere. <laughs> well, now, in my book, as I say, I have questions, not answers. But in order to motivate the questions, I sketch, sketch a theory of how the particular memes of religion could have gotten started and turned into the memes that we can recognize today. What's the evolutionary, the cultural evolutionary history of the memes of religion? And today I'm just going to give you a sketch of that sketch. But I wanted to give you some sense of, of the directions it's going, because there's a few surprising perspectives, I think, in it. And it begins with uh, the genetic base. You get, first of all, you, the, this doesn't happen in chimpanzees. It doesn't happen in wolves or whales. It only happens in our species. And the uh, efforts to, to jumpstart culture in other species have not succeeded. So there's got to be some sort of genetic base in which it starts. And I want to suggest part of that is something that, in fact, we do share with dogs and cats, in fact, with, with um, many vertebrates and basically all mammals. And that is, when something surprising or startling or puzzling happens, our natural first reaction is, who's there? Who's there? We jump to the conclusion that there might be an agent out there, something with beliefs and desires. And this is a useful thing to do, because maybe it does have beliefs and desires, and it desires you. And so, when perhaps some of you experienced this just a few days ago, your dog is sort of half asleep on the hearth, and some snow falls off the roof and lands with a thud outside, and the dog is up growling. Who's there? It's a very useful instinct to have, and we share it with many animals. But in other animals, it sort of stops there. They, they, they growl, they look around, they do an orienting response, so-called. But they can't talk about it, and they can't reflect on it very much. So it doesn't generate what it does in us, which is lots of sort of phantom ideas of who those agents are. Goblins, ghosts, ghouls, imps, fairies, goddesses, angels, who knows, leprechauns. What happens is, I'm, and this is not just my theory, There's, I discuss in my book the literature that has developed this in more detail. We get in individual brains and in communities of individual brains, we get a sort of population explosion of invisible agents. Well, which of those survive? The ones that are the fittest as ideas. Which are those? Those are the ones that are unforgettable. Those are the ones that are so interesting, so vivid, so piquant, 
that you can't stop thinking about them. So you rehearse them and rehearse them and rehearse them in your head, and you spread them to your neighbor, and pretty soon the idea gets one of a talking tree out there in the forest. And it spreads and it mutates a little bit, and then it has to compete with other ideas. Ideas of rain gods and, and bear gods and wolf gods and who knows what other gods, mushroom gods for that matter. And pretty soon this population explosion is sorted out on the basis of really memorability. So the first step then is the hyperactive agent detection device. That's what Justin Barrett calls it, what I call the instinct to adopt the intentional stance, to treat things that you don't understand as if they were agents. And this is what generates then a population of phantoms, of agent phantoms. And this competition for rehearsal sprays and brains, and some win and some just go extinct. What are the winners for? What are they for? What good are they? They're for living in brains. That's what they're for. That's all they're for. We have to think about their own fitness first. Maybe they're no goose at all. They're just a byproduct of the way we're set up, and they happen because they can happen. Of course, once they're there, they're available to be pressed into all kinds of interesting services. So it's not surprising that they don't just hang around there as these sort of phantoms for long. What I want to suggest now, here's my riddle. What do folk religions have in common with squirrels, rats, pigeons, and barn swallows? What do those species all have in common? They're not domesticated, they're wild, but they have evolved to live in close harmony with human beings. Many of their behavioral features and other features, their, 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 their digestive capacities, have been beautifully optimized for living off us. They're not afraid to get close, but they know how to keep their distance. We don't own them. We're not responsible for them. They're just with us. And that's the status of the original wild ideas from which religions have descended. What happened was that the original folk ideas of religion became domesticated. And in this regard, this is like the transition from spoken language to written language. <coughs> spoken languages are also wild memes. There's a lot of people who don't believe that. There's, there's usage mavens and grammar scolds and people say tut tut you shouldn't say ain't and all that who think they are protecting the purity of the English language or the French language. There's people who make it a point of gar being guardians of the language. They're in unnecessary. That work does not have to be done. Languages can do very well on their own. They have evolved for thousands of years to live in us and they're going to go right on living us. They don't need to be domesticated. If writing, on the other hand, that takes guardians, that takes stewardship. You've got to teach people to write. It's an interesting difference. And it's a difference that we can also see in many features of religions. Let's think about sheep for a moment. How clever of sheep to acquire shepherds. <laughs> what a smart move that was for sheep. Think of it. What did they do? It permitted them they could outsource all of their problems, their protection from predators, finding of food, health maintenance, all at a rather modest cost of some loss of free, mate, of free mating. Was this a fitness boosting move on the part of the sheep? It sure was. I don't know how many, I've been meaning to look this up, how many millions or hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of sheep there are in the world today. Their nearest wild relatives, the descendants of their common ancestor, you could carry off in a few arcs. What a fitness boost domestication was for those wild ancestors of today's sheep. But of course it was not the sheep's cleverness. Sheep are, as you know, not the brightest of animals. <laughs> Whose cleverness was it? 
Well, it was nobody's cleverness, except it was evolution's cleverness. Uh, Francis Crick once jokingly coined what he calls Orgel's second rule. This is named after his colleague, <laughs> Leslie Orgel, which is evolution is cleverer than you are. Notice that's not the hypothesis of intelligent design. <laughs> it looks like it because what it acknowledges is evolution blindly discovers designs that are brilliant, but it does it without any cleverness of its own, without any insight, without any foresight. Just by brute force, it discovers these brilliant solutions. And the same thing happens in culture. The wild memes of religion got themselves domesticated. They acquired stewards, people who were prepared to devote their lives, their whole careers, to protecting and fostering and nurturing these wild memes that they have become domesticated. And that changes everything. Well, again, I don't have time to do more than just sketch a few of the uses to which these domesticated god memes were put. One of the likely sources I get from a wonderful, if sometimes irritatingly eccentric book by Julian Jaynes, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Julian and I became fast friends before his death a few years ago. I think it's a wonderful book. It's full of great ideas and also some ideas that are not so great, which is itself a sort of evolutionary factor. And there's many people that are just fountains of ideas, some of which are really good and some of which are not so good, and they're not very good judges. But they just let them all fly, and the good ones get replicated. Other people do the editing. Julian was one of those. And he pointed out that when human societies got into larger groups, he speculates that decision-making became really difficult for them. It was oppressive. What do I do now? What do I even think about now? This became a serious problem. As you all know, there are few feelings more uncomfortable than indecision, than us not knowing what to do next. Well, you can always flip a coin. And what James pointed out is there was a population explosion of exopsychic decision tools back in those days, ways of flipping coins. You could look at tea leaves, you could consult the entrails of animals, you could set fire to various things and see where the smoke blew. You, you could pour molten wax into water. There were literally dozens, may actually hundreds of different techniques for flipping coins. It obviously served some perceived or misperceived human need. People needed something to fix them with some conviction and get them off the dime and get them going on one course or another. And even if it was no better than a coin flip, at least it was a coin flip that stuck. I mean, if you're going to decide whether to marry the girl or go to war, you know, flipping a coin is, it's a, li it's a little, you might say, flippant. You need something with a little more excitement to it to, to hold your attention. So you have a ritual. You have a very important ritual, maybe even a terrifying ritual. Maybe you even sacrifice a virgin to get the answer. Then, by golly, when you get your answer, you do it. So that's one possible use for these God memes. Another one is as a prop in creating a placebo effect. This is an idea developed by an anthropologist named McLennan, who notices that all folk religions all over the world there are shamanic healers, witch doctors. And these have been around for as long as anybody can tell, forever, in, not forever of course, but as long as there have been human groups. And if you've read Jared Diamond's wonderful book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you know how our ancestors pretty well exhaustively search the world for the foodstuffs and the domesticatable plants and animals in their environments. They also, Jared doesn't make a big thing of this, but they also found all the medicinal plants, all the good hallucinogens, they pretty well prospected whatever was there and the techniques for delivering them, for cooking them, for making them less toxic. And some of these, of course, are very elaborate. So we can expect that shamans everywhere 
at no small personal risk to themselves, have pretty well invented and reinvented and reinvented the ways of providing medicinal help and creating really strong placebo effects through ritual. Basically, McLennan argues, what these rituals are, 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 this is folk hypnosis. And folk hypnosis really works. Hypnosis is a really good analgesic. It is a really, it, c it can actually cure a lot of ailments. Now think of this. Back in those days when there was no regular medicine, there was just folk medicine, just shamanic healing, if you were susceptible to hypnosis, you had an HMO. And if you weren't, you were stuck. You didn't have any health insurance at all. So there could have been a very strong selection pressure for susceptibility to hypnosis. <coughs> Compare this with now a case which is not speculative at all now, and that's lactose tolerance in adulthood. How many of you cannot drink and digest fresh milk? A few. Most of you can. Those of us that can, that's weird for a mammal. That's absolutely weird for a mammal post weaning to be able to digest fresh milk. It requires a genetic change, and this has been very carefully studied, and it turns out that the people that by and large can't digest fresh milk are the people whose ancestry does not include dairy herding. Those that include dairy herding, by and large, they evolved the, t the, the, the ability to digest milk in adulthood, fresh milk. The suggestion then is there might be similarly a coevolution between genes and culture. Because after all, dairy herding is culturally spread. It's, it's not in the genes. It's in cultural transmission, but it puts a stamp in the genes of those who have that culture. And we might have the same thing for shamanic healing. It's an interesting idea. There's some, if you read a book by a man named Dean Hamer a few years ago called The God Gene, he thinks he's found just such a gene that's, that, which, is, which is variable in human populations and which seems to be ideally placed as a gene for a protein for a neuromodulator uh, uh, balancer. And it would be just the sort of gene that variation in which would uh, make some people more emotionally aroused by various rituals or more susceptible to ritual. So this is not proven, but it's the sort of thing that we should look for. Then, of course, there's the idea of surrogate police. Big Brother is watching. There's all sorts of uses to which these various ideas can be put. And I'm not going to spend any more time on this sketch of a sketch. So what I want to say, just in, in, in summary, is that Today's organized religions, the ones that have written texts and long traditions and so forth, are descended from folk religions, which were wild. And the religions that started off were, as I said, like pigeons, rats, barn swallows, and so forth. And when we became conscious, deliberate stewards of our ideas, this changed everything. And it changed everything in a way that I've, I've written quite a bit about in my earlier books. Let me introduce a, a, a sort of fanciful technical term of mine, a free-floating rationale. What you see here on the screen here is a cuckoo chick. Cuckoos, you know, are parasites. They don't lay their own, they don't make their own nests. The mother cuckoo, when she's ready to lay her egg, she goes to the egg of a, of a host species, an unwitting host species. She jumps down into the nest while the uh, parents are away, lays her egg with the, with the eggs that have already been laid. Very often she'll kick an egg or two out of the, out of the nest, in, just in case the host can count. You know. <laughs> and then goes away, never to return. The cuckoo is raised by the host parents. And the first thing the cuckoo chick does when it comes out of its eggs, and they tend to, to mature quickly and, and hatch first, I wonder why, is the next thing that they do. They actually have a depression in their back that seems designed for this. They turn around, they don't have, they're, they're blind, they're, they're featherless, they're the scrawniest, saddest looking little things, but they wrestle and wrench and wrestle and wrench and they push an egg or two out so that they get a bigger share 
of the food that's gathered by the host parents. Now, that's pretty shocking, but don't worry, the, the cuckoo doesn't know anything about this. The cuckoo is blameless. It, it doesn't have to understand what it's doing any more than the lancet fluke has to understand what it's doing. They, they don't, the rationale for what it's doing is very clear, but it's not the cuckoo's rationale. The cuckoo doesn't have to have it in its little bird brain. The rationale is not represented anywhere it is simply uncovered by the process of natural selection. That's why I call it a free-floating rationale. And those are the rationales of all the bargains in nature until we bargainers come along, until we start representing reasons and becoming stewards. And then those free-floating rationales get augmented with rationales that we dream up ourselves with our own ulterior purposes. So we have the rationale of Dicrocelium dendriticum and of the cuckoo chick, and those are free-floating. The, you know, Dicrocelium dendriticum does a pretty amazing thing, but it's, it's about as smart as a carrot, I figure. You know, it's not exactly a rocket scientist. Doesn't have to be. But when we get to organize religion, we have stewards who think, why am I doing this? They start being reflective and thinking, cui bono? Who benefits? Who benefits from this? And of course, often the answer is going to be, well, it would be a lot easier for me to do my work if I had this feature. That's the rational thing to do. We all try to streamline our jobs, make life as easy as we can. And even when we have full, intense faith in the project that we're engaged in, that very reason makes us want to do the job better. But, but this also has a way of muddying the waters and interfering, no longer just free-floating rationales, we begin to get these contaminated or added to with, with human rationales that are not free-floating but are anchored in disgust in individual minds. So this shift is a major shift from free-floating rationales to represented rationales. It's like the rationales of animal domesticators. If you look at domesticated animals, you realize that a lot of their features are not for the benefit of the animals. They're for the benefit of the domesticators. So this is a major transition in the evolution of religious ideas. Or at least this is what I'm suggesting. Here's a quote from a theologian that I like. If survival of the fittest has any validity as a slogan, then the Bible seems a fair candidate for the accolade of the fittest of texts. What this nicely draws our attention to is the idea that in cultural evolution, it's the fitness of the cultural item, not the fitness of the people. I would guess that in the last two weeks, I have had the following discussion with, a, with two dozen people. It runs like this. Oh, you think there's, a, there's an evolutionary story to, to tell about religion? I say, yes. They say, oh, what good do you think religion does for uh, us human beings? What, what do you think it's for? And I say, well, that's one question, but that's not the first question. The first question you want to ask is, cui bono, whose benefit? What good does it do the religions? Maybe these ideas have evolved because they can, because they're just symbiotically living with us because they can. Now, I started off talking about a parasite, but parasites are symbionts, things that live with others. And symbionts are generally classified into three kinds. There's parasites, which are bad for your fitness. There's mutualists, which actually are beneficial to you. And then there's the commensals, which are neutral. As you sit here now, as I stand here now, each of us is about 100 trillion cells. 100 trillion. Nine out of 10 of those cells are not human cells. Nine out of 10 of the cells inside your clothes are not yours. They're your symbiont visitors. Fortunately, most of those are not serious parasites. They are mutualists or commensals. A lot of them, of course, you couldn't live without. Without the flora in your gut, you couldn't digest your food. You couldn't live. The same thing is going to be true of cultural ideas. Some of them are going to be so important to us we can't live without them. Some of them are going to be parasitic, but not, nothing to worry about, you know, athlete's foot, come on, it's not going to kill you. 
It's not fitness enhancing, but it's not a big problem. And some of them are going to be just neutral. And what we should recognize is that these cultural visitors, these cultural symbionts, are what make us so different from all other species. It's what gives us the capacity to have these perspectives on the world and on the future that no other species has. Now, I think I'm, you've already been very patient. I will run a few more minutes if I may. And I want to talk a bit about a few of the interesting adaptations of religious ideas. I don't think they were invented by any individual. I think they have only free-floating rationales, but they're really potent and they're beautifully designed. And one of my favorites, and I have a whole chapter on this, is belief and belief. Now, what's that? Well, some people believe in God, right? And then there's people that believe in belief in God. Now, some people who believe in belief in God don't believe in God. They've lost their faith, but they regret that. If you believe in believe in God, you think believe in God is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I, gee, I wish I could believe in God. I wish everybody believed in God. They're distinct beliefs, right? Now, here's an interesting question. Is there more of one than the other? And the answer is there are more people who believe in belief in God than there are who believe in God. Well, how do I know? Well, because essentially all people who believe in God also believe in belief in God. There's very few people who regret the fact that they believe in God, you know? Wish it were otherwise. So all of them believe in God and they believe in belief in God. Then there's all the people who believe in belief in God only. There's many more of them than there are of the, of the, of the others. How many more? We can't tell. Because here's another feature of religions. They've made it, now that they're now that they're organized, virtually impossible for people to act on their belief in God in ways that are distinguishable from acting on their belief in belief in God. After all, what do you do if you just believe in belief in God? You say you believe in God, you pray, you give money to the church, you do all of those things because you believe in belief in God. There are a great many people who seem to be perfectly religious, and in fact, they just believe in belief in God. They wish they believed in God, but they don't. And you know what? It doesn't matter. And their churches are quite happy to have them. The whole idea of belief in God is on the verge of being replaced with the idea of belief in belief in God, which of course puts arguments about atheism, for instance, in a completely different light. Now, just a few more items. Okay, there's Lucy and Desi. And you know, Lucy thinks rock is to die for. And Desi thinks rock is to die for. But Lucy's thinking of rock Hudson, and Desi's thinking of rock music. The fact is, they don't really share anything, do they? Just a term. They have completely different conceptions of what this rock is that's so wonderful. Now I submit, that's so true in the world of religion, too. Say, oh, you believe in God. Oh, so do I. I believe in God. But then if you examine the concepts of God, you see they're completely distinct. They don't believe in the same God. So what do you share? You share a belief in the belief in God. And that's pretty much all. That's why the term is so important. Well, why do people cling to this? Why, do they, why is it so important that so many people cling to the belief that just about everybody believes in God? First of all, I have been studying the statistics on this, and I don't think there's any really good and v valuable research that's been done yet on what people actually believe for, the, for these reasons, some of the, which I go into in the book. The brilliant adaptation of fostering guilt for disbelief is playing a tremendous role in our country now. It means, for instance, that politicians absolutely will not admit it if they're atheists because they know they can't be elected. Here's a sign. I took a picture of this sign in rural Maine as I was driving up to my farm. 
good without God becomes zero. The idea that you can't be moral if you're not religious is a theme that is hammered on and hammered on and hammered on by religion, and as near as I can tell, it has no basis in fact, whatever. One of my favorite chapters in the book is on the relationship between morality and religion, and it looks even-handedly, looking at the evidence, at whether or not religion makes you moral. No evidence. There's significant evidence that it doesn't. I like to quote Steven Weinberg, the physicist, who says, good people do good things, bad people do bad things, but to get a good person to do a bad thing, that takes religion. <laughs> <laughs> and there certainly are many cases of that. There are also, of course, many cases of religion m making people much better than they otherwise would be. I'm prepared to look at the evidence for all of that and see how it adds up, but we have to look at all of the evidence. We have to look at the t positive and the negative. All right, now one last little bit, and then I'm going to stop, take some questions. I have this sentence up here on the screen, which I can't even pronounce. It's in Turkish. But I believe it. Well, actually, I believe it's true. In fact, if there's anybody in this room who would like to bet me $1,000 on the truth of this sentence, I'll take the bet. I believe that this is a true sentence. I haven't the faintest idea what it means. I believe it's true because I asked a trusted Turkish colleague to give me a true sentence of Turkish and not tell me what it means. That's what he did. Nothing mysterious about this. It's easy enough to accomplish this trick. So here's a case where I believe that the, what's up there, that formula, is a truth. And I have no idea what it means. So I don't believe it. I just believe that whatever it says, it's true. Okay? Now, here's another one. E equals mc squared. You believe it? Hands up. Yeah? All right. How many of you really understand what it means? <laughs> yeah, we got a few physicists here. I'm pretty good on it, uh, but I dare say a good physicist could give me a multiple choice test where I exhibited that I didn't understand at all that well. I can do a few of the algebraic manipulations, but you know, there's a lot that's packed in there that I probably wouldn't do very well. And so here's an interesting division of labor. We lay people do the believing and we leave the understanding to the experts. <laughs> and it works very well in some areas. There's no reason not to do that. Even scientists, can, can, they can do this. They can use formulae in their own work that they don't really understand. But that's all right because there's somebody in the next department who really understands it. It works fine in most areas. It works fine in science. It doesn't work so well in religion. So I believe both these sentences, but I don't understand the first, and I semi-understand the second, but I'm confident that there are people that really understand it. In the case of religious formulae, however, even the experts claim not to understand. And that is in itself a really interesting phenomenon. You wonder how it arose and why, and I have some things to say about that. I'm going to end with a question. How many of you believe in Ampulex Compressa? Huh? <laughs> Hands up, those of you who believe in Ampulex Compressa? You don't know what it is. And I didn't know what it was till a few days ago either. Now I know what it is, and I believe in it. You are not equipped to either believe or disbelieve in this. Oh, it turns out to be one of those parasites, another one. It's quite a wonderful one. I submit that the fact that people are prepared to lay down their lives if necessary in order to defend their profession of belief in propositions that they themselves declare they don't understand is a really fascinating fact about our species. Just one of many. Now let's see, what do I have left here? What I want to suggest then is that religions are extraordinarily interesting phenomena. They're powerful forces in people's lives, and they are brilliantly designed. If you think about them as brilliantly designed social artifacts, then you see them in a different perspective. You start looking under the hood to see what makes them work. And very often we can figure it out. 
When we understand their design, then we can be in a better position to see what we might want to do. If we wanted to revise their design, if we wanted to reform their design, if we want to do anything about religion, whether we want to foster it and protect it and make it better, or whether we want to diminish it, we better understand how it works. That's the point of my book. Thank you very much. My goodness. It's I thought your book was interesting in that it seemed to be a book of sociology written by a philosopher. And it seems to me you vastly underestimate the influence of group activity. Sociology is a study of groups and of sociability, of social interaction. Uh, in D.C., if I wanted to go to a church, I could go to a different church every day, every once a yeah. week, and for 10 years I wouldn't yeah. go to the same church. If I wanted to go to a group of atheists gathered together, I think there used to be an ethical culture society in D.C. I don't even know if it still exists. But it seems to me much of religion is prompted by that social desire to be with other people. Oh, I, I, I agree entirely And it's got very little to do with ideas. Oh, um, I agree with everything but the last claim. And, and, and you know, um, uh, David Sloan Wilson is an evolutionary biologist who's looked very closely at sociology, and he's the, the sort of chief defender of the, the sort of uh, uh, sociality explanations of religion, the sort of group selectionist idea. And I take David's work very seriously, and I think he, partly because he takes the sociology very seriously, and he's been using as best he can, and with a lot of, of informants in the sociological community, he's been using their research to try to to uh, confirm hypotheses of his own. I, I uh, agree that I don't ha spend a lot of time on sociology in the book. That's because I thought people are already doing a lot of work on that. I want to look at some of the corners that are less, less well illuminated. The, <coughs> the fact that you're bringing uh, some of the science to bear on these issues, I think, is extremely important, especially at this time. And this idea that biology has something to say about religion is something that's long overdue coming from the uh, the academic quarter so I applaud the book when you were putting up the the this the list of ideas and you started out with this notion of parasites and then qu quickly went from Catholicism Islam to freedom and justice um, I guess if you could have something to say about the different role you see yourself as a philosopher of science versus a philosopher in general because what seems to be missing is a taxonomy of these ideas. Because on the one hand, th these notions of these parasitic ideas, that religion and their, their ability to get people to do things against their own self-interest, yep. due to the val unlike the values of the Enlightenment, which there are breaks on the extent to which we would compromise our self-interest to defend notions like freedom and justice. So if you could say something about mm. the different role yep. you see as a philosopher in this taxonomy of ideas yep. versus the biological approach to the overall program? Um, thanks, that's a very good question. Um, I would say, first of all, that the um, sorting of ideas into the parasites, the mutualists, and the commensals is hard in biology, and it's even harder in, in culture. And after all, you have to remember that insofar as biology is concerned, what a what an, uh, an idea is measured by its effect on genetic fitness. But that just doesn't matter to most of us. Um, lots of the ideas that we take very seriously, religious and secular alike, have nothing to do with improving our genetic fitness. Um, they have to do with improving our joy or our happiness or our fame. Or, and some of those maybe indirectly uh, uh, are traceable back to genetic fitness. But this is not about genes. Now, in the, in the world of ideas, in fact, I have argued in other works, the structure of ideas in our minds creates whole new perspectives and whole new values, which people can adopt under certain conditions and will, and will spread. And then we can even get to the point where we are evaluating them now really, truly normatively. Which, which are the good ideas? Not which are the ones that are biologically successful, not which are the ones that are culturally successful. And we, we know all these questions. It's not which song is at the top of the top ten, it's which is a good song. And they aren't always the good ones. 
Now, once we get into the land of normativity, then, of course, uh, you might say philosophy kicks in uh, into in overdrive. And I have a lot to say about that, but only a little bit in this book because I wanted to keep the book short. I've had a lot to say about it in other places. Um, you, you referenced um, Dean Hamer. Yes. And, uh, I take it you don't agree that he has found the God gene. I don't agree. Mary. Okay, but you seem to imply that we need more research. Oh, sure. Or I think I think um, uh, I think Dean Hamer's book is interesting. I think he's onto something. I think he has overstated the case by a wide measure. I think, in a way, that's okay. In a way, it's unfortunate because it tends to poison the well for people coming after him who might make a more moderate and subtle case. Uh, but. It's not that he's got to be wrong. It's just that he's, it's sort of, that's a very oversimple account that he offers. How do you, how do you uh, see the mystic, particularly the apophatic mystic where there's no image of God, and also in the Kabbalists, the Ainsof, infinite nothingness, as a dynamic influence in your Design. I don't have a lot to say about that in the book, but I have my I have my own views on that. Um, I I do think that uh, part of that those traditions. Uh, first of all, this is something that's not in the book, but let me let me just let me just say that um, uh, I think that meditation techniques are worth studying in their own right quite independently of any questions of religion. And there is simply no question that meditation techniques create all sorts of interesting phenomena. Whether they give anybody any insight into anything other than maybe the state of their own psyche at the time is another matter, and I am I'm actually very skeptical about that. But then, given that that's the case, that people are uh, motivated to build systems of a sort of thought of a sort of the of the kind that you're 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 giving expression to is a, is a phenomenon that i uh would count as sort of it's religion by courtesy but it's 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 not really religion i for me uh you have to have a working definition and for me, my working definition is that religion is, is a social system that postulates supernatural agents whose approval is to be sought. In other words, a religion without a God that can act and a God that can be prayed to is not a religion in my book. It's, there are many things which are like religions. And in the end, the, the definition is not that important because I'm going to look both sides of the line anyway. You know, there was a time when, we, when people classified, uh, you know, dolphins as fish. Turns out that's not a good classification. Maybe a lot of the things that we classify as religions now, we really shouldn't. But we don't yet have the systematic theory which says what the right taxonomies are. Maybe just one more question. I think it's probably getting pretty late. Is there another question? No. What's your impression of uh, gender differences in approaches to religion? It seems to me that in most organized religions, it's the men who hold all the leadership positions, and women seem to outnumber men in the pews and keeping the traditions alive. Um, that is certainly the pattern that is observable in many in many religions. Uh, the women play very secondary roles, or even no role at all. Uh, there are exceptions to that. I haven't done a careful study of that, but I think it's a very good topic that deserves future uh, that deserves careful uh, research in the future. I'd be very interested to see, for instance, if there are any clear parallels to some of the findings in evolutionary biology looking at sort of gender reversal roles in child rearing and so forth, that, uh, see whether there's any interesting parallels are. There may be, but I don't know. Thank you so much. It was such Thank you. One host is a uh, is a say a, a mouse and it has to get itself into the belly of a cat well now what would you do if you were inside a mouse and you needed to get inside a cat what would you do to that mouse what you do is you turn it into mighty mouse make it fearless and bold so it runs right out in the open 
It's not showing off. It's not hunting for food. It's not doing anything to benefit itself. It is on a fairly self-destructive course, but it's of great benefit to Toxoplasma gondii. <laughs> now, these are sort of spooky cases where we have a sort of hijacker that a parasite that infects the brain of a host and induces suicidal behavior. Behavior which has no benefit at all uh, to, the, to the genetic fitness of, of the host. And you might ask yourself the question, gosh, uh, does anything like that happen in us? <laughs> Pretty spooky. Well, I'd like to remind you that the Arabic word Islam means submission. It means surrender of self-interest to the will of Allah. But it's not just Islam, Christianity too. This is a bad photograph, I apologize for the quality of this, of a, of a piece of parchment, music manuscript that I got in a Paris bookstall about 50 years ago, and it dates from the uh, 16th century, from about 1540. And it's sort of interesting, if you, uh, if you squint just right, you maybe can read what it says. It says, um, Semen est verbum dei sator autem Christus. The est is understood. Interesting little curiosity is that Christus is spelled with the Greek chi rho, xp, and then the scribe hasn't known that the rho was an r, so he's added an r, sort of a belt and suspender. So we have chi rho, r-i-s-t-u-s. What's that mean? It means, as anybody who took first year Latin will tell you, the word of God is a seed, and the sower of the seed is Christ. And it goes on to say, Omnis qui audit eum manebit in eternum. All who hears the word will have eternal life. So there's a quid pro quo. Now, what are these? These are ideas to die for. These are ideas that inhabit people's brains and inspire them to set aside their genetic interests, to set aside their interests in grandchildren, to set aside the risk to their lives, to devote their lives to the furtherance of an idea that has become lodged in their brain. There's many ideas to die for. For instance, there's not just Islam and, say, Catholicism, there's communism. Think of how many people in the last century gave up their lives and killed a lot of other people in order to further that idea. Or democracy is another good idea that a lot of people have given up their lives for. Willingly, eagerly. Justice, freedom. I live in Massachusetts, just to the north of me, in New Hampshire. The license plates look like this. Live free or die. That is the motto of... I'm Carla Cohen. <coughs> I'm one of the owners of Politics and Prose. And I want to welcome all of you tonight, and I particularly, we're very honored to have Daniel Dennett here. Um, this is, um, I know that a lot of you are here because of the importance of the topic. Last week I went to see the Darwin exhibit at the Museum of Natural History in New York. The exhibit was not only a chance for a layperson to understand more about Darwin's theory, but it was a glimpse of the culture wars that we are now undergoing in the United States. Throughout the exhibit, one could see purposeful answers to the attacks on natural selection. There was a discussion of what a scientific theory is. There was a discussion of what the theory has contributed to science. And there was a discussion of the difference between religion and science, and how scientists can be religious. For this reason, it is only, and I use the word advisedly, natural that Dr. Dennett would write a book about the human need for spirituality. Dr. Daniel Dennett is one of the leading philosophers in the United States. He teaches at Tufts University and heads the Center for Cognitive Studies there. He has been consistent in his professional interests, looking at the question, how can meaning, design, and morality arise in a universe that began as meaningless without form? He answers that Darwinism gives us the perspective to see how meaning and function and purpose can come to exist in a world that is intrinsically meaningless. And he, in, in this, his new book, Breaking the Spell, examines the uh, natural evolution of religion as a way of explaining phenomenon 
material phenomenon. So it's a companion piece to Darwin's dangerous idea, and um, but a completely different kind of book as well. So we're very, very happy to have Dr. Daniel Dennett here. Thank you. Uh, I hope it's I hope it's worth the wait. I'm sorry that I'm uh, late in getting set up, but uh, you're very very kind to wait. Now let's see if my technology will work. Yes, wonderful. A few years ago, I found myself asking the, myself the question: What's going to happen to religion in the next hundred years, or just in my lifetime? What what are we going to see? What's going to happen? And I came to the realization I didn't have the foggiest idea what was going to happen. But then, as far as I could tell, nobody else did either. There were a lot of people that had convictions, but there didn't seem to be any way of sorting them out. Just to give you an idea of how, how sort of uh, strangely uh, uh, uncertain it is, I want to just walk through five possible scenarios. There's others. But these are just sort of five possible scenarios of what might happen to religion in the next few decades in the next hundred years, something like this. The first one I want to look at is, well, the Enlightenment's over, you know. Uh, uh, religion is going gonna, is gonna to sweep the planet. Now, which religion is it going to be? It's not really clear. Uh, maybe it'll be Islam, maybe it'll be Christianity, maybe it'll be Buddhism, who knows. Whatever religion yours is, if you have a religion, it probably won't be yours. There are more people who don't want your religion to sweep the planet than who do, no matter what your religion is. Uh, so it's worth bearing that in mind. Well, there's one prospect. Here's another one, is that religion is, in fact, in its death throes. There are some people who believe that and who think that what we're seeing now are the last sort of chaotic spasms, that, that, that within the life of, of our grandchildren, perhaps, it will really pretty well evaporate the, the Enlightenment anticipation, which was certainly what people thought a few hundred years ago. They were just wrong. But it's going to come true just a few centuries late. And that, who knows, maybe the, uh, the Vatican will become, you know, the European Museum of Roman Catholicism. <laughs> maybe, maybe Mecca will become Disney's Magic Kingdom of Allah. You think, uh, never going to happen, never going to happen. Well, Stranger things have happened. After all, here's the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. It started off as a church, of course. Then it was a mosque. Now it's a museum. And that's in Turkey. So who knows what the future will bring? There's another hypothesis. Let's look at a third. Maybe religions are going to transform themselves into something unlike anything we've seen on this planet. Sort of creedless moral teams with a lot of teamwork, a lot of pageantry. Different songs, different colors, different traditions, loyalty, you know. Would you want your daughter to marry a Yankees fan? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll have a sort of creedless moral teamwork with pageantry. That's, that's, that's a possibility. And of course there are some churches which are already going in those directions. Another possibility is that maybe religion will just diminish in prestige. Uh, more or less the way smoking has. You know, this is, yeah, you can be elected to office if you smoke, but you know, you should sort of do it, you know, in privacy, and you shouldn't interfere with anybody else in the practice of your religion. Maybe, maybe we can have a, a, a scene where, where uh, uh, religions are, are tolerated, of course, uh, but, but not encouraged, and, uh, uh, and certainly not in any particular sense honored. There's another prospect, rather unlikely, I'm sure. And then there's another one. Judgment Day arrives. <laughs> and there may be people in this room who think, oh, that's it, finally he's got to the truth. You know, that's what's going to happen. And, and if, you, if you believe the recent Newsweek poll, uh, something like a majority of our fellow citizens believe that this is true. Something like a majority. And I don't know, 20% think it's going to happen in their own lifetime. Well, now there's five scenarios, and what's puzzling about this, what's, what's unsettling about this is the following. All but one of these, <laughs> maybe all of them, are, are, are not just false, but wildly false. Which one's right? Nobody knows. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. And it seems to me that's a pretty shocking state of affairs, that we, we are so unable to 
cast our predictive eyes ahead and think about what's going to happen to religion. That's, that was the state of mind I was in when I decided it really is time to see what's happening in the, in the attempt to study religion scientifically. The way we study economies and energy budgets and global warming and El Nino and fresh water and all the other important prod, uh, physical Religions are born, sects are born every day. The websites can't keep up with them. Most of them last a few weeks or a few months or maybe a year or two and then go extinct. We don't know how many thousands, how many tens of thousands of religions have come and gone in the last hundred thousand years. Maybe it's millions, gone without a trace. But some have survived and flourished and leave a very big footprint on the world. And the question is why? What is it about them as natural phenomena that's permitted them to have the staying power, the stamina, the robustness, the growth? These are questions that you can ask as a, as a historian, as a, as a, as a theologian, as a, as a psychologist, as an archaeologist. You can also ask them as a biologist. This is, these facts are perfectly visible to the natural sciences. It's hard to know whether the natural sciences can do anything to study them. I want to say, in fact, they can. These are, these are good questions that a biologist should scratch his or her head about and see what they come up with. Not just biologists, but biologists among others. What's it for? How does it perpetuate itself? Second law of thermodynamics tells us that nothing complicated survives without renewal, without, without repair. What what maintains these amazing structures over centuries, over vast distances of time and space? Well, here's another thing that might really fascinate a biologist from Mars, or you. Suppose you are out in the meadow and you see an ant that's climbing up a blade of grass. Climbs and climbs. If it falls, it climbs again. Climbs and climbs until it gets to the very top of that blade of grass. Sort of like Sisyphus rolling his rock. It keeps climbing up. You think, what is this ant doing? What, what benefit accrues to this ant? Is it, is it looking for food? Is it looking for its cousins, its brothers, its sisters? Is it looking for a mate? Is it showing off? What is it doing? What benefit accrues to the ant? If you ask yourself that question, it turns out you're asking the wrong question. No benefit accrues to the ant at all. Well, then what is this colossal expenditure of energy for? Is it just a fluke? Yeah, it's just a fluke. It's a brain fluke, a lancet fluke. It's a small parasite, brain worm, if you like, has climbed into the ant's brain and lodged there and is now driving it like an all-terrain vehicle up a blade of grass because it, the fluke, has to get into the belly of a sheep or a cow to continue its life cycle. Salmon fight to swim upstream so that they can breed. Birds fly long distances. We all recently learned about the penguins. What an amazing thing they do. Dichrocelium dendriticum has an easy route. It just climbs into an ant's brain and full speed ahead up that blade of grass. <laughs> That's pretty spooky. It's not, it's not a, a, an isolated case. There are, in fact, many parasites that manipulate their hosts. Here's another one. Ta Toxoplasma gondii, uh, this uh, problems, a uh, uh, phenomenon, natural <laughs> phenomenon in the planet. We, we really want to know what's going to happen. We ought to be able to get some purchase on it. In other words, what we need to do is we need to study religion scientifically the same way we'd study these other, these other projects. That's all I'm asking. But, of course, this is a frightening and disturbing prospect to many people. That's why this book is, unlike my earlier books, uh, uh, it's a much more, in some sense, political book. It's not, it's not a philosophy book for philosophers, and it's not a scientific book for scientists. It's a book for everybody about the need to study religion scientifically, the importance of that, and a sketch of how we might go about doing it. It doesn't have answers, it has questions. Religion is manifestly, among other things, a natural phenomenon. 
It's a social phenomenon. You can see it. You can measure it. You can study it. You can do statistics on it. You can look at its history. And that's what I'm proposing that we should do. Something that is as familiar as religion is something that we might want to get a little distance from by pretending we were Martians. Thinking about what would Martian scientists think of when they came to this planet? What would, they, what would strike them? Uh, what would, what would strike them as in need of explanation? And here's one thing. I wonder if anybody knows what this is a picture of. Looks, it looks a little bit like it might be a, something you'd see under a, a, a microscopic slide, some sort of interesting uh, infestation there down at the bottom. I'll tell you what that is. That's a satellite photograph taken in 2001 of the Kumela gathering in North. There's approximately a million people in that picture gathering on the banks of the Ganges and going in into the river. That's perhaps the largest single gathering of human beings that's ever happened on the planet. Happens every dozen years. Here's a similar gathering, not quite so large or impressive, but in a very impressive place. And here's another one. Certainly the Martian biologists, the Martian, the uh, Exo-Martian faunologists, this is what they call themselves, studying the animals on a, another planet, would find among the phenomena that were really fascinating these tremendously energetic, expensive, extravagant gatherings. And they think, what on earth is going on here? Uh, and how did all this originate? And the answer to that is, well, it originated all fairly recently by geological or biological standards, religion is very young. It's only been around for maybe tens of thousands of years. It's younger than language, and that's been around hard to say. Some people think a million years, some people think a few hundred thousand years. Agriculture is 10,000 years old. The oldest known organized religion, Judaism, is only 2,000 years old. Or maybe that's not the oldest, maybe we can go back to some some earlier religions, but there, there's no, there's no well-known, well-understood religion that we can go back more than about 3,000 years. That's, that's very young, and, and of course a lot of the religions are much younger. Uh, the Mormons, very recent religion. And we know that 